It is so good to see you here tonight and to know that you're interested in these things that we are studying. And we are continuing to study concerning certain things about the history of that nation through which God sent his Savior of all mankind, the nation of ancient Israel, the Savior, of course, being Jesus Christ. We're in that period of their history that's called the divided kingdom. If you do not yet have a copy of the king chart, Raise your hand and Thomas will see that you get one, won't you, Thomas? All right. Brother Jason over here has lost his. I, I mean, he needs one. <laughs> now, if you'll look on that chart briefly, you will see that we have come down on the side of the kings of Judah on the left, down to... Jehoram or Jeroboam, uh, no, Jehoram or Joram it's sometimes called. Over in northern Israel, we have also come to a man named by the same name, Jehoram. So we have two Jehorams ruling. Now we'll have occasion to refer to uh, some of these kings again. In fact, as we begin our study tonight in the first chapter of Second Kings, we are going to study and look at an episode that took place in the life of Ahaziah, the king in northern Israel that was before Jehoram, the son of Ahab. Now, back in the last chapter of First Kings, we learned that Ahaziah was a wicked man and that uh, that is characteristic of all of the kings in northern Israel. But we read here in verse 2 that Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria, that's the capital of the country, and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, that's Philistines, whether I shall recover of this disease. He wanted to know, uh, how am I going to come out of this? And you can understand why he would want to know. In the meantime, however, the Lord had said to Elijah, you go down and meet those messengers that are on their way to look up this God of, the, of, the, of Ekron. And you say to them in verse 3, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? And so you go back and tell him, the king, thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou art gone up, but shall surely die. Well, the messengers got the message and they hastened back to Ahaziah. In fact, Ahaziah was wondered how come they got back so quick? Well, they told him, there came a man to meet us. And he said, is it not because there's not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? And he also said, you're not gonna get off your bed, you're gonna die right there. Well, Ahaziah said, well, what manner of man was he? Well, they told him, a hairy man, verse 8, girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And Ahaziah said, oh, no. Well, he it actually it doesn't say he said, oh, no, but I know he said, oh, no. <laughs> That's Elijah. Now, he had understanding about Elijah because of Elijah's uh, relationship with his father, Ahab. He knew about Elijah. All northern Israel knew about Elijah. And Ahaziah was not pleased to get word from Elijah. He was going to take care of Elijah, he thought. So we see in verse 9, he selected a captain with 50 men and go and get him. Well, 
When they came, verse 10, Elijah called down fire upon them and devoured all 50 of them. Ahaziah's plan didn't work. Well, he wasn't willing to quit, however. He sent another 50 in verse 11. And when they came, Elijah said, let fire come down from heaven, consume them. Consume them too. So that's a hundred now, a hundred to nothing. As he's consuming these men that come to capture him. So Ahaziah set a third 50. Well, the captain of the third 50, he had had a little more discretion. When he came, he prayed in verse 13, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. And so he did not send down fire upon them to devour them. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with them, be not afraid of him. So uh, Elijah goes with these men to see Ahaziah. And then look what he told him in verse 16. For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up and but surely die. Notice how much Elijah, under the threat, changed his message. He didn't change his message, did he? Not one syllable did he change his message. It didn't make any difference what the situation was when he got a message from God. That was the message that he delivered. Folks, doesn't that teach us a lesson? Don't we have a message from God? We don't have a right under extenuating circumstances to twist it, to alter it, to make it fit a little easier on Tell what God said. That's been the problem of mankind down through the history of the human family, hasn't it? He has always tampered with and wanted to change a little bit here and there about what God has said. Well, that wasn't characteristic of Elijah. And verse 17 says of about uh, Ahaziah, he died. And Jehoram, he becomes king. Now, Jehoram is his brother. The reason his brother takes over the throne is because Ahaziah didn't have an heir. I believe I had mentioned that maybe before. He didn't have anybody of his family or uh, descendancy to take over uh, the throne. So Jehoram is now king in northern Israel. At this point, we're going to sort of leave the kings. We'll have occasion to refer to them occasionally, but we're going to particularly focus our attention upon two of the greatest men of the Old Testament, prophets of God, Elijah and Elisha. Now, the first verse of chapter 2 tells us the time had come for Elijah to be taken up by a whirlwind. We have seen Elijah in his service before God in a number of instances already. We saw him when he predicted the coming drought. We saw him when he had the contest at Mount Carmel. We saw him when he condemned Ahab and Jezebel because of what they did about Naboth. We see Elijah dealing, doing God's will all down through these turbulent times in northern Israel. Keep in mind now, as we study these two prophets, their life was difficult because they were servants of God, doing the will of God, but in the one of the most rebellious nations that ever existed, and that was northern Israel. Surely, I think we can appreciate the fact that they would have a hard time. Now, Earlier, during the time when Elijah was discouraged at the juniper tree and in the cave, among things God told him to do was to go and select a man to be his successor as prophet. And that, of course, would be Elisha. 
and Elisha went with him. And Elisha has been following him uh, ever since that time. Well, in verse 4, we read how that Elijah and Elisha come to Jericho. And in verse 7, they stood beside the Jordan River. And in verse 8, Elijah took his mantle, that was his coat, one of his garments, and he smote the waters, the waters parted, and they went over on dry ground. Obviously, this was a miracle, just as much as a miracle as when Joshua led the people of Israel across the Jordan River toward the city of Jericho to begin with when they took the land. This is the second time the River Jordan had been parted. And it's not the last time either. We're going to read about it being parted again in a little bit. But they went over on dry ground. Elisha makes a request of Elijah. Elijah asked him, what shall I do for thee? And Elijah, Elisha said, I pray thee, in verse 9, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. That's a tremendous request. Look at the spirit of Elijah. Now, this is not talking about the Holy Spirit. This is talking about his spirit, his disposition, his attitude. His conviction, his dedication, how he went about his work. Could he possibly be excelled? Well, it would be hard to excel him, but Elisha, I think Elisha is asking not so much for his own glory, but since he's going to take the place of Elijah as prophet in the land, he wanted to be sure he could do a good job. He knew he would have to be like Elijah and all the power that he could gather for himself. That, that's what he wanted. Elijah said, okay, I'll do that for you if you see me when I leave. Well, he does see him when, when, he, when he leaves. And in verse 11 tells us, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Well, this is the second man that we read about in the Bible that did not experience death as all the rest of the descendants of Adam and Eve have to experience. Who was the first fellow? Big pardon? Enoch. Enoch, okay. I'm sure that's what you said to begin with, but I wanted to make sure it was right. No, I didn't hear you. All right. Uh, Enoch. You know, it said of Enoch that he walked with God and God took him. From that, we get the implication he, he didn't lay down and die like, like the rest. But God just, just took him. And here, that's about what he does with Elijah, too. It, God just took him. Now, in somewhat of a more dramatic and an explained situation, chariot of fire in a whirlwind, quite sensational, wasn't it? But Elisha saw all this, verse 12, and Elijah dropped his mantle, and Elisha took up the mantle, and he went back to the river, and he, in verse 14, he took the mantle, and he smote the waters, it says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And when he smote those waters, what happened? Third time, River Jordan separated. He went across in dry land, or dry ground. Now, it is, I think, very significant to note in verse 15, folks, that there were prophets that saw all this, this wasn't done way off by themselves, just these two men. This whole episode was seen by others. Why? Now, if they'd just gone off and done this privately, Elisha could have said, well, he went up in the whirlwind and all that. Oh, Shaw, you know that wasn't the way it was. They wouldn't have believed it. He had witnesses to back him up in this. And when he smote those waters and they parted just like they did with Elijah, what did that show? 
God was with Elisha just like he had been with Elijah. And Elisha needed that confidence. He needed that support. He needed that confirmation. God provided it. By allowing these people to see all this, it's right interesting to think these people at first said, oh, uh, 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 Elijah's or God's taking him over here uh, out in the field somewhere, up in the mountain somewhere. We'll go find him. And they spent three days looking for him. Elisha said, there's no use in looking for him. He's gone. Well, they went out anyway, looked for three days and came back and said, we didn't find Elisha said, in, what we had said today, I told you so. I told you he's gone. And he was gone. Verse 18, did I not say unto you, go not? Now, beginning with verse 19, we have the career of Elisha. He does so many things. Elisha really doesn't deal a great amount with the kings like Elijah did. He deals with the prophets. He deals with widows. He deals with the people of the land. And he is not as fiery as Elijah was. He was of a gentler nature and a softer spirit. Not that he was compromising in the least, but he just wasn't quite the stern prophet that Elijah was, which shows to me God can use people of all kind of dispositions, can't he? You know, sometimes people criticize preachers. He's a fireball. Well, you know, there are times when there needs to be a fireball. And they said, oh, he's so gentle and calm and soft. Well, there are times for that sort of fella too, provided you don't get an overdose of it. And God can use all of the different talents that people have. And that's something that we can learn also. Folks, regardless of your disposition, if you're trying to keep it in the harmony of the Lord, the Lord can use you and me if we will allow him to do so. And here with verse 19, the first thing he runs into, he runs into the fact that in verse 19, the water is not. And in other words, it, it was bad and polluted in some way. In verse 21, he throws salt into the water and he heals it. Now, this might have been a natural reaction, but since it's, uh, the Lord had told him what to do, uh, the Lord healed the waters, this, this is a miracle. This was a direct intervention on the part of deity that cleared up these waters for these people. Well, in verse 23, we have a rather peculiar situation. In verse 23, you see the, the words, little children. Those words literally mean, we're told by those who understand the Hebrew language, these were not small little children. These were people probably in their upper teens or early 20s. They were young rascals. And what were they doing? They were saying to Elijah, go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. Now, if you don't have any hair, just be glad you're like Elisha. You never thought you'd be like a prophet of God. Now, I wasn't talking about you. I see, I see some, one or two hairs on your head. Uh, <laughs> but, what, what are they doing? They're mocking this man. They're ridiculing this man. They're making fun of this man. A prophet of God. Well, they wish they hadn't because there came out 42 uh, she-bears. Uh, they came out two she-bears and killed 42 of those rascals. And so they weren't so proud of their mockery of God's servant. I think I've mentioned to you before, haven't I? Sometimes you run into people who think that if they can just cut down God's messenger, they'll cut down God's message. That won't work. You can cut a preacher down to the ground, but if he preaches the truth, you haven't done a thing to the truth whatsoever. And so we need to focus our attention on the message and sometimes a messenger, he may not always be everything we would want him to be. 
And let me say that trying to be a messenger, few of us who are messengers are ever everything that we would want to be. I've been listening to some tapes that I made 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years ago, and I listen to those and I just cringe. Did I do that way? Why did I yell right there? Who was I mad at? And I sure messed up that point, didn't I? But you're never everything you want to be. And uh, people don't always like a certain deliverer. But folks, if he's teaching the truth, you need to respect him for the sake of the truth and not be like these people. You might run into a she-bear somewhere. Now, in chapter 3, we're still in northern Israel, and we're going to read about Jehoram, the son of Ahab. We won't read about the kings a lot, but we do read about one here. It says in verse 2, he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father. Jehoram was evil. He was bad. But he wasn't as bad as Ahab. In fact, there's few people in all the Bible, short of the devil, that was as bad as Ahab. He was, he, he was, he was at the bottom. Now, we read here in verse 3, however, Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. You remember how Jeroboam, though he was promised if he would obey God, God would make him a great king, but he changed all of God's worship. He changed God's laws. He went his own way. He did things like he liked to do. And as a result, he brought sin in the nation. And that's what Jehoram did. Well, when Ahab died, Ahab had been successful in conquering some of the nearby people. One of those that he held captive were the people of Moab, the Moabites. But when he died, the Moabites took advantage of that situation and rebelled against the king of Israel, rebelled against Jehoram. Well, in verse 7, this is what Jehoram did. He went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. Now, Jehoshaphat, we've already learned, he's dead, and Jehoram is the king over here in southern Judah. But this is an episode that dealt with Jehoshaphat and Jehoram. So he goes to Jehoshaphat and he says, The king of Moab have rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And poor Jehoshaphat, it looks like he just won't learn. He liked to got killed going with Ahab. He wisely refused to go and ally with Ahaziah. But now he is making himself an ally of Jehoram. And he says, I will go up. And so they go toward Moab. And on the way, they go through the wilderness of Edom. And what do they do? The king of Israel and the king of Judah, they get the king of Edom, a heathen king to go with them. Now why they got this heathen king but they went along and there was a shortage of water in verse 9 and Jehoram said uh, this is, this is what, how, how we're going to lose out. We're going to perish because there was no water. He said God's going to deliver us into the hand of Moab verse 10. But Jehoshaphat said, verse 11, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And somebody said, There's Elisha. So Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to see Elisha. It's right interesting in verse 13, Elisha said, I wouldn't have anything to do with you at all if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, as we had noted, had been a pretty good king. He, he wasn't all that he ought to be, but he was, he was better than most. 
And Elisha said, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fool with you at all. But he, in verse 16, the Lord told him these instructions. Make this valley full of ditches. And he said, you won't see the wind and you won't see the rain, but the waters, the ditches you dig are going to be filled with water. You know, God has used water so many times to accomplish his purposes, hasn't he? Noah to baptism. And right here, he's going to use water again. And there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. Well, the Moabites, they gathered all their army, armor in verse 21. They went up to battle. And the way that they approached the battle and the way that the sun was shining on the water, the Moabites made a very faulty conclusion. They saw the sun on that water and they said, that's blood. Those three kings, they couldn't get along. They've gotten into it. They've killed all themselves and fought among themselves. That's blood up there. It's ours. We'll just go up there and take over. Wasn't blood when they got there. And these three kings fell on the Moabites and they defeated these Moabites and they beat down the cities in verse 25 and they felled all the good trees and the king of Moab saw that it was too sore for him and he was so distressed. Now I want you to notice in verse 27 that he offered a burnt offering upon the wall he killed his own son as sacrifice. Now this is the king of Moab, heathen nation. You'd expect the heathens to do something like that, wouldn't you? But you never would expect God to accept a human sacrifice. Now God had once told Abraham to offer Isaac, but he stopped him, didn't he? He didn't, he didn't let him go through with that. And I know a lot of people differ with me on this, but they can get right any time they want to about Jephthah. There are a lot of folks, and there's some reason to think that Jephthah may have killed his daughter. I don't think so. He offered her just like you'd offer a burnt offering as a burnt offering, completely given into the service of God. If Jephthah had killed his daughter, he would have been doing like the very heathen nations God told him not to imitate. And he wouldn't have accepted that sacrifice. I don't think Jephthah killed his daughter. It, it's not going to affect your way to get to heaven either way. But anyway, uh, this, the, the point I want to make here, this Moabite killing his son, that was even more than the Israelites could take. So I knew that they would think that was an abomination unto them. But the, the rebellion of the Moabites was put down. Well, in chapter 4, we find Elisha, and he helps a woman who was the wife of one of the sons of the prophets. Verse 1 says, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And they are obviously in debt. Uh, you can tell he's a preacher. And he's in debt. And he said, the man is coming to take my sons into slavery and servitude to pay off this debt. And in verse 2, Elisha said, what hast thou in thy house? And she didn't have anything but a pot of oil. He said, you go out and borrow all the vessels that you can borrow. You get every pot and pan and everything that you could possibly get and bring it in. And so she did. And he said, now you start pouring out that oil and fill up these vessels. And she did and fell, uh, filled up every one of them. And then he said, now go sell the oil and after you sell the oil, why, you pay off the debt and your sons won't go into slavery. Now, this was obviously a miracle, a miracle of supply, a miracle where God provided that which ordinarily would not be the case, would he? 
but he helped this wife who was a widow and whose sons were about to be taken. You see, when I said a little while ago that Elijah was going to do things with more of the common people, more of the population, gentler service unto other people. This was an example of it, wasn't it? He relieved this poor soul and he did what he could for her. Now I want you to notice. Who delivered this widow? God did. When did God deliver the burdens of this widow? When she did what she was told to do. Now, if she had said, I don't want to go out and borrow all these pots and pans, the people are going to wonder, what the world are you doing? I don't want to pour out there. I don't, I'm not a salesman. If she had had an attitude not to obey, I expect her sons had been carried off into captivity and she wouldn't have paid the debt. But when she did what God said, this is the lesson, she was blessed. Don't you know God will do the same thing for you and me? That's what he's promised. Well, we'll stop right there for tonight. Thomas has already let me know I'm done. And that always happens when we do God's will. He's going to do his follow-up on he'll, he'll keep his part if we'll do ours. You know, when we look back in, the, in that uh, second chapter, we was talking about the, when he put the song, what did he say? He said, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. I didn't do this. Yeah. He, he but gave, I did put the song in. He gave, but he had to do it. Yeah. If he hadn't have done it, we've got to follow God's instructions. Well, Lord willing, we'll begin with verse 8 of chapter 4 next week.